This is Integza! And to make this video more interesting, I decided we should play a game. A drinking game! It goes like this. Every time I say the word torque on this video, you guys have to drink a shot of your beverage of choice. Which, if you're under 18, it should be chocolate milk. But anyway, roll the tape! Oh right, I run this channel on my own. Just a second. Archimedes once said, Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I shall move the world. Which is a pretty cool quote, but also a very stupid one, since you can't really lift a giant ball floating around space. Because in space, there's no up or down. Of course he didn't know that at the time. And he kind of has a point. The longer the lever is, the easiest it is to lift the weight near the center of rotation. This is possible thanks to the law of conservation of energy. Energy that in this case is described as a force through a distance. Because each point on the lever goes a different distance, each point produces a different force, to compensate, thus maintaining the energy balance. A lever is a very useful tool, and it is to engineers what mayonnaise is to the French. They use it in everything, with the exception of soup. That's such a bad analogy! The rotational force in a lever is defined as torque. And torque as a simple equation, where T is equal to the force times the normal distance to the center of rotation. As you can see, torque is very easy to calculate, but not that easy to measure. On my last video I designed and printed a Tesla turbine, a device that transforms the energy in a moving fluid into mechanical power. I wanted to calculate this power, but for that I needed to know the torque. To be able to measure the torsion force created by the turbine, I first needed to understand torque, feel the torque, be one with the torque. After reaching the Nirvana, I was finally aware that torque can be divided into two categories, static torque and dynamic torque. Static torque, as the intuitive name tells us, is a kind of torque that doesn't generate movement. All the forces are in equilibrium, and the net torque is zero. On the other hand, we have dynamic torque. In this case, one of the forces is greater than the other, so the object is accelerated in a rotational manner. The static torque was easy to measure, I just needed a lever with a known length and a way to measure the force applied at that distance. For the lever I designed a simple and small hammer, which I baptized as Thor. You know, because Thor has a hammer and we're trying to measure torque. After printing the hammer I removed it from... I remove it... Not worthy. After printing the hammer I removed it from the table to be fixed on the axis of the turbine with a screw. As a way to measure the force I used the kitchen scale, which I placed under the hammer's head. As the turbine would try to move, it would pressure the scale down and give me a force in the form of grams, which knowing the length of the hammer, I could later convert into torque. In my first trial I tested the turbine in a reversed way, using a DC motor and a 9 volt battery to power it. The scale measured 11 grams of force. Knowing that my hammer has a length of 150 millimeters, which is completely above average, we get a torque of 16 newtons per millimeter. Next I measure the force generated using the same setup, but instead of the motor, I use pressurized air at 9 bars. This time we got about 7 grams of force, which translates into 11 newtons millimeter. Practically speaking, this means if I attach the wire directly to the axis of the turbine, which has a diameter of 10 mm, I would be able to hold a 2 kg weight with the force generated by the pressurized air. Notice how I said hold and not lift the weight, because with static torque you don't get any movement. This is why static torque is not that revealing, because if you want to hold something, you use a screw. Motors in turbines are normally used to generate movement, and that's the reason why the torque on the specs of a motor is most of the times linked to a correspondent rotational speed. To lift the weight we need to talk about torque associated with rotation. We need to talk about dynamic torque. Dynamic torque is not so easy to measure, but there are several ways of doing it. 
Because I wanted to design a simple and cheap torque meter, I researched a bit to try and find the most suitable solution. After browsing the interweb for a while, I started to get desperate. All the solutions I was finding were either too expensive or too complex, but in that moment, one of you guys saved the day. Gravinerd, an expert in all things mechanical and also a subscriber to this channel, gave me a tip in the form of a comment. He basically suggested that I could build a prony brake. What's a prony brake? Well, I also didn't know. So I decided to once more visit Lady Google for some answers. And now I will explain what I have learned. A prony brake is a simple device invented by Gaspard de Prony to measure torque. It works by fixing a clamp or belt around the rotating shaft so you can measure the force transferred to the clamp through friction. Because dynamic torque needs to be linked to an RPM value, I decided to also measure the rotation speed using the same setup I used in my DIY digital tachometer video. This is what you'll need. An Arduino Mega, an LCD shield, a load cell, a signal amplifier, a photo interrupter, a breakout board for the photo interrupter, a 220 ohms resistor, some pins, an A to B USB cable, a soldering machine, a computer and a degree in sociology. <laughs> I'm just kidding, nobody needs a sociology degree. A load cell is basically a force sensor that changes its electrical resistance according to the deformation caused by the acting force. This generates a very small change in voltage that needs to be amplified, filtered and digitalized by the signal amplifier. This sensor will have the same function as the kitchen scale had in the measurement of the static torque. To measure the rotation speed we will use a photo interrupter, a simple sensor that projects infrared light from one side of its gap to the other. If the light is able to cross the gap, we have one state. If we obstruct the light, we have another. Using this binary sensor along with a double gap flywheel, we can know how many times the sensor is triggered per minute, which in turn tells us the turbine's rotational speed. The first step is to solder everything. First I soldered some pins on the signal amplifier board. As you can see, my soldering skills have improved significantly. Next I soldered the photo interrupter to the breakout board. One pin, two... Oh come on, you're embarrassing me, just stick to the thing! Ah oh, Jesus! Ok, two pins, three pins, four pins and five pins, easy! Next the 220 ohms resistor and the three wires to 5 volts, ground and signal. The breakout board is labeled, so if you mess it up is 100% your fault. This is the final result. Once everything is soldered, it's time to make some connections. First connect the load cell to the signal amplifier. To make it easier for you to remember the configuration, I prepared this song. Red is in the E+, plus. black is in the minus E. If you want to be happy, Please subscribe to me. You may put the white in the A minus and the green in the plus A. Put a like on this video if you think that rainbows are gay. Connect the respective 5 volts and ground ports on the signal amplifier and breakout board to the 5 volts and ground pins present in the LCD shield. Connect the signal wire of the breakout board to the analog pin 8 and the data and clock wires of the signal amplifier to the digital pins 26 and 27. Now that everything is connected, you can plug the LCD shield into the Arduino. Just align the pins of the shield with the pins of the Arduino and connect. The hardware part is now completed. What we need now is to inject some ones and zeros to the Mega. Take your A to B cable and plug it into the Arduino and your computer. The first bit of code we're going to use is the calibration code for the load cell, so we can make sure that the sensor is outputting real values. Download the sketch linked in the description of this video and open it up in the Arduino IDE. If you don't know what the Arduino IDE is, well, it's basically a software that allows you to upload code to your Arduino board. You can download it on the Arduino page or use the link I left in the description. Once you get all the downloads done, you need to fix your load cell on a vise by clamping the end that has the wires. Using the Arduino IDE, 
upload the calibration code to your Arduino and open the serial monitor to see what values the load cell is putting out. In my case I used grams since the load cell has a reading limit of 500 grams, but you can change the units in the sketch. After that you need to find a small object and measure its mass. Then put it on top of the other end of the load cell and adjust the calibration factor value on the sketch until you get the exact weight of the object. If you made it this far, congratulations! You just learned how to build the crappy scale. But to make this measure torque and rotation speed, we first need to assemble both sensors on the turbine. For that I designed and printed some simple parts. Oh right, you also need a 3D printer. I completely forgot to say that in the beginning of the video. Well don't worry, the parts I designed are made of very simple geometries, so you can also cut them out of a sheet of wood or plastic and then glue them together. In my case I prefer to 3D print them, because I suck at crafts. First I printed the friction clamp that will be tightened around the axis. To minimize the heat generated during the rotation, I interfaced the connection with the teflon bushing I had laying around. Next I printed the double gap flywheel to obstruct the photo interrupter two times per revolution. I had to cover it in aluminium tape, because I found out some videos ago that PLA is completely transparent to infrared radiation. To fix the sensors I printed a support piece to each one of them, which I then put in place using M3 screws and fast drying glue, because time is money and slow glue is for losers. With all this done I still needed a piece of code to read the data from both sensors, process said data into RPM and torque values and then output those values to the LCD display. In less than half an hour I was able to write a simple piece of code that does the job. And by write I mean borrow bits of code from several tutorials and smack them together like a crappy coding collage. As always all the tutorials I used shall be linked in the description below. This is what the low cost 3D printed Arduino controlled prony break should look like in the end. To pre-test the apparatus I first used my finger and got a stunning value of 5 newtons per millimeter. No pain, no gain. Next, to make sure the load cell was giving viable results, I connected the motor to the shaft of the turbine and used the 9 volt battery again, which gave me a torque of 8 newtons millimeter with a rotation speed of around 1000 rpm. By checking the performance specs of the motor, I found out that this motor is able to output 141 rpm per newton millimeter. Multiplying this value by the 8 newton millimeter we got from the device, we get a theoretical speed of 1136 rpm, which is really close to the real value, considering that the motor was under load. The cheap DIY torque meter was validated, it was time to test it with pressurized air. After unleashing the full 9 bars of pressure into the turbine, the shaft started rotating and pressing on the load cell. At the LCD the values for the speed and torque started to rise. As the turbine accelerated, the torque reached a max value of 11 newtons millimeter at a speed of 3300 rotations per minute. Because this time I have the torque and the correspondent rotational speed, I can easily calculate the power outputted. Which actually makes me think, this is not a torque meter, this is a power meter. And this power meter measured the top power of 38 watts. Do you know what you can do with 38 watts of power? You can charge your phone, power a LED light and listen to music. But you can only do one at a time. The power is limited and we all know music is the priority. Some of you asked me to test the turbine in a reversed way, as a pump, but because pumping water would be really messy, I decided to invert things and pump air into water. I put some water in the scaled cup and inserted the tube connected to the turbine inside the water. After fixing the motor on the support with a bit of tape, I turned it on with a 9 volt battery, and as you can see, the water in the tube is being pushed by the pressurized air. At one point the pressure was enough to push all the water inside the tube and make the tube produce bubbles. Even so, it was not enough to detect changes in the level of water. This is it for today. I hope you... Oh, here you are. Just a moment.
I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, as always, the 3D models, <laughs> the code, and the software are available in the description below. If you want to choose the theme for my next video, please visit the tab, community tab, on my channel. And remember...